Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Happy New Year. We've got a great show for you tonight. We're gonna to be talking about four things that I see all the time in my practice that really sabotage a person's capacity to heal. So stay with me. These are four major things. Most of you probably do them on a regular basis and we're gonna go through them point by point so that you can understand why it's important to not do them. So that being said, if you're new to the show and you don't know the drill, type your questions in now. Um, I'll do my best to get as many answered throughout the show as I can get answered. It's first come, first serve basis. Try to keep your questions on topic. Tonight we're going off of kind of part two of what we talked about last week, which was you know, our introduction of the No Grain, No Pain 30-day challenge as we kick off the new year. We want you to attempt that 30-day challenge so that you can strive for better health and overall improving your quality of life through improving your health. So let's dive into the four things that keep your body from healing. And so number one on the list, this is a big one, and that's if you take any kind of medication. Now, this understand this is not me telling you to stop taking your medications. I, this is not what I'm saying. Um, but what I want you to understand is that if you're having to take medication, if you're currently on uh, medications in general, one of the big problems that medications create is something, now let's change that color here. It's something called drug-induced nutritional deficiencies. Most medications don't come without a cost. And that cost to you, if you're taking medicines, is nutritional deficiencies. And the problem with that is if you're trying to heal, your body needs all the nutrients that it can get. And so if you're on medications that deplete those nutrients, then you're going to have a harder time recovering and healing. Let me give you a couple of common examples. Aspirin. And now many of you are taking that baby aspirin because your cardiologist told you, you know, he wants you to reduce your risk of stroke or heart attack. Baby aspirin does several different things. Even at a baby aspirin is generally about 85 milligrams a day. A, a big aspirin is 325 milligrams. A baby aspirin is 85. It only takes 7.5 milligrams of aspirin to damage the lining of your GI tract, particularly your stomach and your upper small intestine. So you can get actually erosion to the level of bleeding where you get, you know, subsequently what, what that leads to is occult blood loss. Now occult blood loss causes iron deficiency and leads to anemia. So it reduces your iron and makes you become anemic, which means that you have low O2, low oxygen. So what do you need to heal, repair, make energy? You need oxygen. What do you need to make? The, the protein that carries oxygen in your red blood cells through your body. You need iron. So again, this is just a simple example because it's such a common one. Aspirin damages the stomach lining, leading to gastric blood loss and iron deficiency. Now, aspirin can also deplete vitamin C, and it can also deplete folate. And folate's important for DNA and RNA replication. Vitamin C is like human duct tape. It fixes everything, repairs everything. But... You can't make new cells without folate. It's very hard for your body to heal, repair, and detoxify without adequate vitamin C. So again, this is just one example using aspirin as if you're doing something every day that inhibits your body's ability to, to take on nutrients, and those nutrients are necessary for healing and repair, you end up in this catch-22 cycle. We'll see the same thing occur um, in people that take blood pressure medicines, they cause blood pressure medicines can deplete zinc and they can deplete CoQ10 and B vitamins. We see the same thing in, in people who are taking antidepressants, the depletion of folate, the depletion of B12. Um, we can see the same thing in people who take diabetes medication, depletion of vitamin B12 and of CoQ10 and of folate. So there's a long, long list. I've actually done an entire show on drug-induced nutritional deficiencies. If you haven't seen it, you might want to go back and refresh yourself on it. But taking medications, in, in my opinion, let's make some room for this. Taking medication, you know, why does your doctor give you medication? Generally, it's to mitigate risk of developing 
a major issue. For example, again, blood pressure medications are given to reduce your blood pressure because that mitigates your risk of having a stroke or a heart attack. So it's mitigation of risk, right? Or the other reason is to treat symptoms. Now they'll tell you they're using it to treat your disease, but in reality, they're not really treating your disease because if they were truly treating your disease, they would treat the origin, the underlying cause of why the disease exists. Most doctors will tell you, yeah, I'm gonna give you this, especially if you have an autoimmune condition that's inflammatory, they'll tell you, I'm gonna give you this steroid to treat the inflammation. Or I'm gonna give you this immune suppressant to treat the inflammation. Or I'm gonna give you this anti-inflammatory, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to treat the inflammation because inflammation is the cause of your disease. So they're not treating your disease, they're treating, cre they're treating the inflammation that's as a consequence of having the disease, but what is causing the inflammation? So treating symptoms, in my opinion, is the wrong avenue to take, especially if you're not looking for the why. What you really wanna do ultimately is you wanna ask, why do you have the symptoms? What's the trigger, right? What is the trigger in that? For many people, what is that trigger? It's food, right? A trigger for a large percentage of you is food and you don't even realize it because your average doctor doesn't study nutrition. They get less than seven hours of nutritional education in their entire uh, pursuance of a doctorate, of a doctor's degree. So that, that you know, most of you may, may not realize this, but doctors don't know jack about nutrition. The vast majority of them know very little to nothing about nutrition. They get their information about nutrition comes from the same commercials on TV that you're watching, which is pretty scary when you think about it, considering that most diseases, one of the major triggers is food, food allergens, food sensitivities, the chemicals that are found in food like pesticides, dyes, preservatives, and additives. These are all the things that are major trigger factors. So again, why, why are you doing risk mitigation and why are you treating symptoms without asking the bigger question or answering the bigger question, which is why the symptoms exist? So what ends up happening is you go on one drug and maybe that drug is mitigating your risk. Maybe it's reducing your risk in one way, but then it's causing this. And so then it, what is it doing subsequently? When you have nutritional deficiencies, it increases your risk in other ways. So you're mitigating risk to increase your risk. Now, that's, that's like saying, I'm gonna put you in the car and I need you to drive 10 miles, but you're on a car treadmill and so as you're driving, you're not really going anywhere, but you're expending gas, right? You're taking energy, effort, time, spending money to go nowhere. And that's a big part of what mitigating risk is all about. It's, it's, it's mitigating risk without asking what's the new risk that we're creating, right? That's why in medicine, there's this terminology that you should ask if you're being put on a drug, which is risk benefit. What is the risk of taking the medicine versus what is the benefit the medicine might provide? And if, and if the risk benefit ratio is imbalanced or is it skewed in a higher favor of risk without actually solving your problem, then again, you're spinning your wheels. You're the hamster on the, on the, uh, on the, on the circular. Uh, treadmill. Then we have, again, treating symptoms. If you're, if you're taking the drug to treat a symptom, like for example, a pain medication, or, or you're taking um, like a skin cream for lo you know, lotion to, with medication in it that is for dry skin or for a rash on the skin, you're treating the symptom without understanding why the thing exists, why the disease exists. And again, that comes with a risk benefit as well. And you need, to, you need to know that because you need to ask this because this is probably one of the biggest holdups. And I'm gonna share a story with you because I had a woman one time, actually this happened several times, but she came to see me. She was on thyroid medication. Now, the, the particular drug she was on, we'll just, we'll just share the story. The drug that she was on was, uh, let's make some room, was Synthroid. So how many of you raise your hand if you have hypothyroidism and you've been put on Synthroid? Synthroid also sometimes if you're taking a generic version, uh, levothyroxine. And so the problem with this medicine is that number one, it's used to provide a source of artificial T4. T4 is thyroid hormone, right? So if you have low thyroid, they give you thyroid hormone in a synthetic version. 
Now, a lot of times what causes low thyroid, what actually causes the disease itself for many people is gluten. And there's, a, there's over 300 studies now that link gluten to low thyroid. So if that's news to you, um, you better get your copy of No Grain, No Pain quickly and start reading it. So Synthroid contains gluten fillers. So again, this is an example of, of people that have actually come to see me in the, in the case of this one woman. She was on Synthroid. She was gluten sensitive. Gluten was actually what was reducing her T4 in the first place, but now she was taking a drug to correct the problem, but it wasn't really correcting the problem. It was getting her exposure to the very thing that originally was causing the problem. So here's how that happened. She initially went gluten-free and did really, really well, got, got better. And the reason why is she was reducing her gluten exposure. But she got to a point in her care where she could no longer overcome any, of, any more hurdles. She got to a plateau, right, where she was stuck. And the reason she was stuck is she was still exposing herself to gluten. Now, it only takes 20 parts per million, the size of a breadcrumb, to create inflammation for up to two months. So here she is, she's popping this medicine every single day that is getting her exposure to the very thing that was contributing to the disease in the first place. Again, what I want you to envision in your mind is the hamster on the wheel, right? You don't go anywhere, you can't get anywhere. The drug doesn't solve your problem per se, it actually contributes to the problem. Now that's not to say that some medicines can't be helpful and that some medicines aren't necessary. Again, this is not me telling you stop taking your medicine. This is a conversation that needs to be had between yourself and your doctor or your team of, of healthcare providers. But I, I want you to understand kind of a scenario that's very, very common. A lot of medicines have gluten fillers. So if you're following my no grain, no pain diet protocols and you're taking multiple medications, you know, one of the things that you should really be doing is read the inactive ingredients because this is where you're going to find the inactive ingredients is where you're going to find the potential for cross contamination not cross contamination but gluten based ingredients so the drug drug labels generally when you go to the pharmacy to pick up your medicine they'll come with this you know this little insert and if you unfold it it's like a it'll fit on the wall it's huge right and on there you're going to find a section that reads inactive ingredients it's not the active ingredient section it's the inactive ingredient section that's the fillers and again, you know, this is where you're going to find things like maltodextrin or pharmaceutical glaze, right? The things they coat the tablet with that can be derived from wheat and barley and rye and oat and corn and rice and other grain-based, sugar-based ingredients. And so that's what you want to look for. So again, in this example, this woman, she hit a plateau. She couldn't get anywhere because why? Because she was still getting daily doses of gluten. So... Taking medicines, aside from the drug-induced nutritional deficiency aspect, many of them will contain ingredients that are far from healthy. This is something I never understood, even going through undergrad and in, and in graduate school. I never understood why so many medicines contain so much unhealthy fillers, right? If the point of a medicine is to help a person get healthy, why would we put all this junk and garbage in them? It never made sense to me. It's, you know, it's a good question to ask your doctor. Why, are you got, why do you have me on a medicine that, that has all this stuff in it? Okay, this next one, looking at number two on the list. So the same woman I'm talking about, as I, this whole show tonight is designed, was designed really off of the experience with one, one individual woman that I was seeing uh, who really hit a plateau, is restaurant eating or restaurant dining. Now, a lot of you are thinking, God, gosh, Dr. Osborne, what, what am I supposed to do? I can't eat out. You know, I can't uh, take medicines because they're contaminated with gluten. Like, what, what am I going to do? Well, I want you to understand why this is so important. When you eat out at restaurants, you're getting exposure to GMO, genetically modified organisms. Those restaurants, you know, unless you're going specifically to a farm-to-table organic restaurant, you know, the vast majority of your restaurants are chains. They're fast food chains, or even they're, they're maybe not fast food, but they're, they're chains across the world. Like, like, I don't want to mention any names, but um, you guys know what I'm talking about. You go, you sit down at these restaurants, and how is it that, that you know, these chain restaurants, how is it that food can taste the same? 
no matter where you go, whether you, you maybe this restaurant could be in New York, in the same, same chain of restaurant in Texas, right? In the same restaurant in California. How does the food from one to the next to the next taste exactly the same, no matter which place you go? Because in my experience, real food actually takes on flavor based on where it was grown, the soil it was grown in, if it's an animal, what it was eating, right? So in order to get the same taste in 300 locations nationwide, you have to do some serious chemical manipulation. And, they, and this is common in the restaurant industry. Chemical manipulation is what allows that food to taste the same no matter where you go. So you, you get all these chemicals that are in the food. And one of the examples is a, is, a, is a substance called meat glue, which is used like if you think you're ordering chicken breast, a lot of times you're, what you're really getting is chicken particulate that's glued together with a microbial enzyme produced by a bacteria. It's called meat glue and it mimics gluten. So it can really sabotage your recovery. It's the same thing they use to make hot dogs. They use it in dairy products. It's used in a number of different confections. So again, this is just one example, but other things like MSG is a common additive in a lot of these products. And then they also add a variety of different texture and, and taste manipulators to these different foods, again, to get the food to taste the same no matter where you're eating it. And so you're being exposed to GMO, you're being exposed to pesticides, you're being exposed to chemicals, and then that doesn't even include the fact that you're also, you know, depending on the restaurant, let's say that, you know, a young guy, and they'll say Jack is working tonight, Jack's 19, he doesn't really care about your gluten-free diet. He understands the gluten-free menu to the same level of expertise that a fifth grader um, who's never heard of gluten understands the gluten-free menu, and he's in charge of, of making your food. So in that attempt, you get a lot of cross-contamination in your food. He's using, you know, if you order a fried food, for example, they're gonna fry your food in the same oil, they fry up everything that contains wheat. If you're, um, if you're ordering a chicken breast that you want it to be grilled, um, that chicken breast is sitting on the same countertop next to chicken fried steak where they've got it battered in wheat. And so there's all this risk of cross-contamination that you're gonna get persistent exposure to. And so restaurant dining is a nightmarish of an idea if you really wanna improve. Now, that, you know, many of you again are thinking, gosh, you know, eating out is such an important part of my social structure. Um, but what I want you to understand is if you decide that you're going to attempt to eat out and do no grain, no pain, you're probably going to be pretty unsuccessful in regards to getting lots of cross-contamination in regards to getting exposure to these things. So it's just not something that I recommend. In the case of the woman that I'm talking about right now, she would eat out on a weekly basis. She wanted to go eat out with her friends. Again, I understand that social interrelationships are very important. My advice is if you've got friends that always want to go to restaurants, eat before you leave and go hang out and have the camaraderie, but don't do it while sabotaging your plans at returning to health, because this is one of the easiest ways to maintain your illness is eating out. Remember food uh, production at restaurants, unless you, you've got a really good organic farm to table type restaurant, you're not going to get something uh, that's good for you, right? And so don't fool yourself. Chick-fil-A Sorry, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is not a healthy fast food option. I hope that's not a newsflash to any of you watching. They have this connotation of health, but, but at the end of the day, it's still fast food. It's still highly chemically processed and manipulated, and, uh, and, and you know it, it, it's still not good for you, right? So don't, don't lie to yourself. If you, again, if you've got a copy of No Grain, No Pain, the very first chapter and one of the fundamental tenets is be true to yourself. Do not lie to yourself, right? All forward progress and good health starts with brutal truth. And sometimes you have to be brutally honest with yourself in order to progress. Okay, number three on the list is alcohol. Now, I'm, I'm going to cross through the word abuse. Um, and just because most of you are probably thinking, well, I don't abuse alcohol. So, so what really does that mean, alcohol abuse? Well, alcohol abuse is... You, you know, in my opinion, is you're drinking it daily, right? If you have a glass of wine at dinner every night, that's, in my opinion, if you're trying to get healthy and you're not, this is abusing alcohol. It's, it's, you're using too much and your body can't overcome it. Um, 
if you drink alcohol, not every day, but you drink more heavily on the weekends and it's consistent, this is a form of abuse. Again, if you're trying to get healthy, I'm not trying to call all of you alcoholics if you do that, but if you're sick and you're trying to figure out why, you need to understand some fun fundamental tenets about alcohol. Number one, it robs your body of the B vitamins. There's actually a disease called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which is alcohol stealing your B vitamins from you. You need B vitamins to heal and repair. Many of you were already B vitamin deficient because of years of gluten-induced intestinal damage, and so you're already malnourished. Keeping alcohol in the equation is going to only serve to sabotage the other areas where you're working hard to try to improve your diet. So um, alcohol robs B vitamins. It steals them. It's a diuretic, so it will dehydrate you. Alcohol is a direct poison. And the byproduct of alcohol, which is acetylaldehyde, your liver has to deal with. Remember, if you are gluten sensitive, your liver is probably already struggling. Alcohol also feeds yeast. Now, if you've listened to me for any length of time, you know that yeast is one of those things that mimics gluten. So if you've got a yeast overgrowth, you've got a gluten reactivity problem, even if you're not eating gluten. Alcohol promotes yeast overgrowth in your GI tract. Alcohol also suppresses your immune system's function. You need your immune system to work well, uh, especially during cold and flu season. So these are just reasons why you, you wouldn't want to do this daily or binge mass drinking in a bigger way on the weekends. So again, especially if you're not healed, if you, if you find yourself and you're still struggling and you're not where you want to be in your health, it's definitely a no-no. Now, if you're healthy and you're doing everything well and you generally follow a good diet, if you want to have a drink here or there, I don't fault you for that and I don't judge you for that. I don't judge you even if you abuse it. That's the price you choose to pay. But my point is, a healthy alcohol consumption is going to be in great degrees of moderation. And moderation is not one glass a night instead of the bottle every night. Like, like some of you have a definition of moderation that needs to be checked and balanced. So again, alcohol for many different reasons is problematic if you're trying to recover and repair. And it's one of those, and again, in the case of the woman that we're talking about tonight, she liked to eat out, she liked to join her friends, and they liked to have a drink socially when they would go out. So here she was taking a medicine that had gluten in it, and gluten was the reason why she was sick in the first place. She was eating at a restaurant on a weekly basis, and when she would go to the restaurant, she would be getting exposure and drinking alcohol as well. So that kind of is the third aspect, right? And then if we bring in the fourth, it's that she didn't prioritize her physical fitness. Now we live in a society where we've, we've marginalized the importance of physical fitness. How do I know that? Go to any grade school in America. What do they do? What do they do in grade school? So in grade school, they take away PE. They deprive your children of physical activity, right? So they take away PE and they make them sit at a desk and follow orders all day long and not ask questions. And so again, they make them use their brain to do, to do crazy work. I don't know if you've, if you've got kids these days, a lot like the math equations, some of the math that they're teaching is, is it's like the long way around. Let's take the 20 mile route when we can do a five second route. But they, they wear down these young kids, they wear down their brains all day long, and then they give them hours of homework to then go home and do. So even when they go home, they don't have an opportunity to really go outside and play. So we've overemphasized this to such a huge degree, and we've completely taken the physical education and the physical activity of children, and we've said that has to be extracurricular. If you're going to do that, you've got to join the sports team, or you've got to do something outside of the hours of school and outside of the hours of homework. So we've got this huge imbalance, right? Your physical and your mental activity should be relatively balanced and it's just not happening. We know it, you know, we've, we've done this to the children, but the adults are just as bad, right? Because what do you do every day? You go to work and what do you do at work? You sit, 
chip typically at a computer desk, right? And so you're on your butt all day and you think that going to the gym, maybe if you even do go to the gym, a lot of people struggle to consistently go to a gym, but maybe they get, you know, anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes, right? And then, but they're at work and they're sitting at a computer eight to 10 hours. So, you know, you look at that differentiation, you're sitting up to 10 hours a day and you're exercising maybe up to 60 minutes a day or one hour a day. And so it's a 10 to one differential between activity and actually um, physical activity and, 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 uh, and work, right? And so the sedentary lifestyle that we live, and then we go home and we're tired because why? Because we've been here in this headspace all day long, so we're men mentally, emotionally drained. We don't have physical energy to do more because our bodies do what? When we sit for eight hours a day, what do our bodies do? They atrophy, they shrink. Actually, what happens when you sit at a desk is your, your posture goes forward and your lung fields can't open up. So you reduce your ability to generate, to get access to oxygen by about 20% just sitting in that chair. Then you couple that with the muscles that you use when you're sitting in that chair. So you, most people are forward posture, head forward, they're, 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 they're hovered over, right? And so these muscles in the front become all they ever use and these muscles in their posterior chain, these muscles in their back and in the back of their neck, they start to weaken and they start to dynamically change. And what do you see in, in, in people as they get older? You see this, this straight, straight good posture start to curve over until when they're older, they're, they're like a decrepit forward postured person, right? And this has to do with, in, in a big way, this sedentary lifestyle. People, as they get older, the longer they do this, their body adapts to sitting all day long. And so the right muscles atrophy, the wrong muscles don't, and they end up with this horrific postural issue, but an imbalance in their physicality, right? And when your muscles work on this premise of use them or lose them, and so if you're not using them properly, they're going to start to deteriorate. And then your physical frame starts to deteriorate. And then what happens is you get pain, right? And then when you get pain, you reach for medicine, right? Pain relief medicines. And many of these medicines affect your liver, they affect your kidneys, they affect your GI tract, they cause vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So you're really just feeding the problem instead of addressing it. So sedentary lifestyle is a huge part of the issue and you have to be able to prioritize the movement that you do in the course of the day if you wanna maintain good health and good longevity. And as you get older into the twilight years of you know, you don't want to you don't want to become decrepit and kind of sneak away as a burden on society or a burden to your family members. You want to maintain your function as long as you possibly can and not be a burden to others. Then you have to prioritize this piece. And again, in this case, this woman, she just her excuse was, I don't have time to exercise. I'm just too tired to exercise. Yet she had time to go to lunch and have drinks taking in poisons, right? So it does, it's not about time. It's not about whether you have time. It's about what you really actually prioritize in your life. And, and if, you, if you commit to priorities and you, and you tell yourself which priorities are the most important for good health and you commit to those, then you won't have an excuse because really there isn't an excuse. You could say, yeah, but I do have a computer job and I do have to sit long periods of time. Okay, what's the solution to that? Obviously, You've got to figure out where exercise fits in. Maybe it's not the gym. Maybe you do some calisthenics at home. Maybe you add some high intensity interval training periodically throughout the day. Maybe you put a treadmill underneath your workstation so that you can walk instead of sitting all day. You don't have to necessarily walk for 10 hours while you're working, but you can walk and sit and walk. I mean, there's lots of different options for you where you can prioritize the movement and the motion that your body needs in order to keep it healthy. But if you don't, you know, there are very few doctors that can predict the future. Actually, I don't know any doctors that can predict your future, um, but I can guarantee an outcome if you don't exercise and you consistently overconsume alcohol and you consistently eat out at restaurants who don't care about your health and feed you poison and call it food, and you take medicines to treat the symptoms that you're experiencing because you do those other three things, I can guarantee you, you will never achieve the health health that you're after. And so that being said, you know, I, w I want you guys to understand that these are big ones. There certainly are other things that can sabotage you, but these are things 
that are non-negotiable. If you're doing these things and you're trying to heal, again, I can guarantee a poor outcome for you if you are. So that being said, I've got some things for you tonight. Now, one, if you don't have your copy of No Grain, No Pain, you can pick that up uh, at nograinnopainbook.com or on Barnes & Noble website or Amazon's website or any other major bookstore. But I've got a QR code for you here, too. This is a gift for you. We've been working on this for a while, my team and I. And so what this is, is it is a, uh, it, this, this QR code will take you straight to Gluten-Free Society. And there's a special page that we've got set up that have No Grain, No Pain Phase one and phase two recipes organized for you. So take advantage of that. Go there, visit that page, because if you're trying to do the 30 day challenge with us, we wanted to give you a resource that you could tap into, a free resource that you could tap into and, uh, and really help you prepare the foods and the meals that are gonna keep you lined up with phase one and with phase two of the diet. So again, I wanna encourage you to use that QR code and, uh, and that resource as you go through the challenge. All right, we're going to take your questions now. Let's see here. What does a liver need to heal from medication or poor diet? You know, a liver needs a break, honestly. Um, your liver is so dynamically wonderful as an organ, it can heal very quickly. But the more you throw medicine at it, the more it's, it's having to deal with environmental poisons and everything else, um, it can really be a struggle. If you're looking for something to help support your liver, as you're trying to work your way off of medications. Uh, we have something called Ultra Liver Detox. I'll put that link up for you, Elba, and you can check that out. But it's got a number of different ingredients in it that help support your liver's ability to detox. Um, if I'm using your Ultra Omega, can I drain it into a spoon and take it as a liquid? Yes, you sure, you sure can if you're having trouble. And then two, you should also look at our Ultra Omega liquid form. We actually have a liquid form as well. Let's see here. Is a non-celiac gluten sensitive person going to react to cross-contamination? Yes. Um, is it the same degree as a person with celiac disease? Yeah, I mean, it can be. Everybody's reaction is going to be varyingly different because we're all different people. But yeah, I mean, just, you know, the, the thing is, what I hear a lot of people say is, oh, I'm not celiac, therefore I can get away with cheating. And that's nonsense. I see people all the time that have severe neurological or severe arthritic types of problems when they cheat, it just flares it. And, and because most, most doctors don't equate food to extra intestinal manifestation or extra intestinal symptoms, which is what that would have be considered, they don't ever make the connection. But um, definitely cheating is not a good idea if you're gluten sensitive, even if you don't have celiac disease. Um, let's see here. Is too much folic acid during pregnancy a contributor to autism? I heard that from a family doctor. Well, folic acid, Dennis, is a bad thing to take, period. Folic acid is a synthetic version or derivative of the B vitamin folate. So I don't recommend folic acid during pregnancy at all. This is, um, unfortunately, it's the type of B vitamin that's in a lot of prenatal vitamins. If you want to get a good prenatal that doesn't have folic acid but has natural folate that the body can recognize and doesn't increase the risk for other problems, check out our ultra prenatal um, on gluten-free society. But um, let's see here. What do you recommend for kids eight years old for COVID? Um, predominantly Kelly vitamin C. It's safe for them to take vitamin C. It's safe for them to take NAC and acetylcysteine. It's safe for them to take extra zinc. Uh, it's safe for them to take uh, vitamin D. Um, you know, if you're working, if you've got a good pediatrician with your kids, you know, a lot of these things can be tested for, but it, all those things are safe. We actually, we have a resource page that we've set up um, online where we address a lot of those of those things to take you know to get over colds and flus or to help your body support your body through colds and flus um, diana is asking about siete siete is a, a tortilla chip that's grain free they are okay where you have to be careful there's two problems that i see with that product is um, number one People just by eating chips and they eat all the chips, right? So like know yourself. And you know, this goes back to be honest and be truthful with yourself. If you buy a bag of chips, are you gonna plow through those in a day? And is that the right thing you wanna do for your health? 
Um, so, so that's one of the problems is that chips are, you know, the old, who's a, one of the companies you can't just eat one, right? But number two, it's uh, the product itself is not organic. So I'm real hesitant to tell you to introduce that product into your diet as a staple um, because of its, and until they come out with an organic product, I'd love to see that company. They're, you know, they're a family run company. I'd love to see them come out with an organic product line. But the other problem is they're super high glycemic. So they are grain free, they are gluten free. So in that regard, they're, they're okay. But, but the glycemic index of the product, you know, when you use cassava, it's a high glycemic food and so high carbohydrate. And so if you're struggling already with a blood sugar issue, or you're trying to lose weight, it might not be the best thing for you to eat, not because it contains gluten, just because it might give you some struggles in that regard. Uh, is it okay to take detox C at the same time I take leave with the roxin? So ideally you want to take your leave with the roxin on an empty stomach. That's generally what, what is recommended for any thyroid medication. So I would, I would look at at least giving yourself a 40, 45 minute gap to 60 minute gap in between. Um, what do you take? If you had to take an antibiotic, Deb wants to know if you, if you took an antibiotic, what do you take? after you're done with the antibiotics. And I assume that's what you mean, Deb. Um, so if you've got an antibiotic and you had to take it because you had some kind of infection that, that needed antibiotic as a treatment, what can you do to support your GI tract recovery? Um, we actually have a product, it's called Ultrabiotic Defense. And so that, that product is designed, uh, it's very, very high dose. So it's several hundred billion colony forming units of different strains of bifido and lactobacillus, bifidobacter and lactobacillus. And, and it's specifically designed intentionally to help support people post-antibiotic, post-surgically. It's also designed if you have had a long history of antibiotics but have never really taken probiotics and don't eat you know, probiotic-rich foods. Now, that's the other thing you should be doing too. Uh, whether you're on an antibiotic or have taken an antibiotic or not, probiotic-rich foods can be very helpful you know, so, so this would be fermented foods. Thing, not, and I'm not talking about kombucha, which is just sugar water. I'm talking about like fermented cabbage, fermented carrots, fermented vegetables um, are good options to get good healthy bacteria naturally as well. Um, what's my favorite type of hard or cookware and bakeware? Cookware, the French company that made cast iron, Le Creuset, I think is the name of it. I don't know if I pronounced it right or not, but um, they have a cast iron enamel that I really like. There's also a number of brands of stainless steel. Just don't buy them if they're made in, in China by U.S. made. Um, but, but stainless steel as well as, as, well as uh, enamel coated cast iron are my favorite ways to cook or pots to use. How long after cross-contamination should it take gluten shield? So you can take it as a, as a general digestive enzyme, Linda, but you should take it for at least a couple of weeks after a major exposure. And then you really want to analyze how you got into that major exposure. And you know, for some people, gluten shield, we use it prophylactically until they really master the diet. Because where people, most people get their cross-contamination is that either they're eating out right? Or they're trusting uh, another family member to prepare their food. Um, or they just are in the process of getting educated about the gluten-free diet and they make mistakes. So, so, you know, it just depends on where you're at in your process. Is there a way to restore platelet counts safely without transfusion or medication? Depends on why, Nancy, you have low platelets. One of the reasons I see for low platelet counts is B vitamin deficiency. So B12, oops. So B12 and folate deficiencies can actually cause low platelet counts. So it might be a good idea to ask your doctor who's monitoring you to measure your cellular levels of B12 and folate. And that may be one of the reasons why you have low platelet counts in the first place. Um, but outside of that, that's a very kind of generalized answer. There certainly can be other reasons why platelets can be low, and that would be something where you would want to work with somebody who understands what those reasons are because, um, you know, especially in today's world, I mean, I, you know, if I was dying, I would take somebody's blood, obviously, to save my life. 
But honestly, um, don't take offense, but if you've, if you've been vaccinated, I wouldn't want to take your blood. You know, again, it's, it's just simply to say, we don't know enough about the long-term consequences of what's going on with this thing. And that to me, that would, that's actually, in, in a sense, I would consider that to be a biohazard. And, and so I would be very, very, very hesitant to want to do a transfusion in this day and age right now with so many blood samples, so many people being contaminated with an unknown that, that we don't know. We just don't have enough data into the future to know whether that's going to be a major, major issue. Uh, Marcus is asking, um, I don't know what you mean, Marcus, as far as a mold master class starting in February, I, I don't know uh, if I could recommend that or not, because I don't know which mold master class or what mold master class you're talking about. Maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more, but um, you know, mold is a tricky thing and um, it's a very tricky thing. And so I, I generally I'm very hesitant to recommend a master class on a topic like that without having vetted it first. So I don't want to tell you no, but I also don't want to tell you yes, because I, I don't know which one you're talking about. Would you mind revisiting um, what your suggestion is for detox using vitamin C? Uh, by a vitamin C biotic defense powder and immune shield powder. So if you're, if you're trying to do just kind of a general detox, vitamin C flushing is a great way to do a detox. And so that, that vitamin C powder, it's basically empty stomach. Start first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. You take six grams of detox C every 15 minutes until you flush and flush is diarrhea it's like prepping for a colonoscopy you're going to flush out your bowels so that's a simple way to to, to reset your bowels and flush everything out um, you know if you're in if you're in bad shape six grams is where you start if you're in good health you can start at three grams you don't have to start at such a high level or such a high dose and then immune shield, if you're talking about immune shield and the proper use, it's if you've got powder, that's two scoops of that powder. And what this is, immune shield is a, it's an antibody surrogate. So it's, it's, a, it's a protein powder that's got antibodies and other immune factors in it. And it, what it helps to do is if there's anything nefarious in your GI tract, abnormal food proteins, undigested material, um, different types of microbes. This surrogate antibody can help to handcuff those things so that you can poop them out. Like that's the intent of immune shield. And, and uh, so if you're using that, that's, you can use that and you can use that daily. Whereas the C flush is just one time. You just do this a one time event. And then after that, you take daily, you can take five grams of vitamin C daily. There's, it's very, very safe. If you can't handle five grams, some people can't because it gives them gas gurgling or, or loose stools, then just back it down until you, you tolerate it. So some people have to go to four, some people have to go to three, some to two, just depends on who you are. Uh, and then if you're talking about probiotic, after you flushed your gut, if you're talking about biotic defense, you take that biotic defense daily, um, you know, and you, you go out at least four weeks. You're, what you're trying to do is really support population of healthy microbiome. So, you want to go out at least four weeks, and I'd, I'd recommend both on, on both of those. So that's, in, in a nutshell, um, the flush component and the detox component of, um, of a simple protocol that you can do. Um, what are the causes of late periods besides pregnancy? So if, you're, if your period is extending out, it, it, generally speaking, yeah, if you're taking chase tree berry and you don't really need it, that might extend out your cycles. But there are lots of other potential reasons. There are a number of different um, number of different environmental exposures to chemicals like plastics, pesticides, mold toxins can all mimic estrogen and create an estrogen dominance effect that can disrupt your periods and cycles. So, I mean, there are a number of different things that can do it. My grandma complains of acid reflux. What should she take to do or help? Um, Lots of things, really, but she should ultimately should get with her doctor to figure out why she's got acid reflux. Um, a lot of people have acid reflux. I see this a lot. Remember I was saying earlier about aspirin. Aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can cause 
uh, damage to the stomach lining and create what appears to look or feel like reflux. Some people have what appears to feel or create acid reflux because they are actually not too much acid, but because they don't have enough acid. And so in that regard, apple cider vinegar might be helpful, betaine. I have something called ultra acid, which has a number of ingredients, but one of the main ingredients is betaine hydrochloride to act as a stomach acid. If it really is damage and acid erosion, she can, if she's just trying to support kind of the recovery, we have something called GI Soothe, and it has aloe and marshmallow and a number of other mucilaginous products in it that are designed to help coat and soothe the lining of the stomach and the esophagus. We can put that information up for you if you'd like. Why are potatoes, why aren't potatoes a good idea? Please refresh briefly. Potatoes are a nightshade, and so many people, when we go on the no grain, no pain protocol, phase two is nightshade free, uh, because there are compounds in nightshades um, that can cause and create an inflammatory process. The other reason why white potatoes in general can be problematic is they're high carbohydrates. So if your diet is already too high in carbohydrates and you're eating lots of potatoes as a staple food, that might be something that sabotages you to get better control over your blood sugar over time. Um, let's see here. I am gluten grain free, regular exercise, adequate sleep and no meds. I keep my diet at roughly 33% protein, carbs, fat, all organic. My recent blood count showed elevated albumin globulin ratio, albumin, elevated albumin, elevated bun creatinine ratio, elevated MCV and MCH levels. Any idea what could be causing this? That's, that's a huge question, probably um, a question that's far too deep for this show. I mean, there are a number of different things that can contribute to all of that. And, and I just, I would not do that question justice in this format. Um, how long does it take to notice improvements from taking ultra dim for hot flashes at night? Within a couple of weeks is generally what we see. Um, I'll turn this, so Barbara wants to know, I'm, I have anaphylaxis response to banana and coconut. I'd like suggestions for alternatives. Any other fruit um, that you'd like to eat? I mean, it, it's really, it's, it's, it's what you like. It's taste is relative. And I, I hate to be so simplistic, but I mean, alternatives, I would send you to Gluten-Free Society's um, recipe section because that might give you a bunch of ideas. I might also send you to Gluten-Free Society's um, home page, or not home page, but um, we have a master list of foods to avoid in, in that regard that you might want to check out um, that would help you. So, because when you know what not to eat, then you can you can actually go back and think about what you like and what you want to eat. Um, can you can you formulate liposomal riboflavin? You know, most of your liposomals, the reason why I don't do a lot of liposomal in my formulation is because what most people don't realize is the vast majority of them are corn derivative. Um, that's the way they make the, the vehicles, the liposomal vehicles. So it's, it's just I'm, I'm, I'm not wild about liposomal for that reason for somebody who's trying to follow a gluten-free diet. Um, I like that. So that's, I like that testimonial there. Go, I don't know where we were, lost it. Oh, I like this. So for me, it was six months, but I followed the diet and went to see him and got tested. I will never eat grains again. Um, felt like I was dying, was taking a lot of medication. I don't anymore. No pills, but vitamins. I, I love that, that type of response story, seeing people have those types of responses to our programs. Armor, somebody's asking about armor thyroid. Yeah, armor contains corn. You have to be really careful with that. Um, my advice, if you're taking thyroid medicine at all, ask your doctor to, if it's got a, a grain derivative in it, ask your doctor to write you a compounded prescription for it. Scroll down just a little bit more on the left. I have mold issues in my gut. How difficult will it be to detox from mercury now that I have taken care of my dental amalgams? I mean, that's, that's a monster of a question because I don't know what else you may have going on. Um, 
as far as length of time to detox from mercury, I mean, you know, it depends on how much mercury you ha you had. I mean, amalgams don't guarantee that your body have or has, you know, high levels of mercury per se. So it just depends on, you know, a no well, a number of variety of different factors, including how generally how healthy your detoxification capacity is. But for most people I see with mercury issues, it's anywhere between six and 12 months to really get mercury out effectively. And that's with the right detox and the right diet and the right lifestyle and everything else. Can stress from politics, news, job, wife, husband cause people not to heal? Of course it can. Stress is a major uh, deteriorating factor around health. So stress definitely can contribute to poor healing, too much stress. An alternative to aspirin to prevent, um, if you're trying to prevent thrombosis, I mean, you might ask your doctor about using, we have something called white willow complex. Uh, but again, you know, if you're trying to prevent a thrombotic event, I'd always ask you to talk to your doctor, but we, we use something called white willow. It's, it's what aspirin is derived from. Aspirin is the synthetic derivative of white willow bark. And so, um, again, it, it has that same similar type of effect on blood thinning. If you've ever listened, um, oh, not a question. So how should I protect myself from taking three grams of valcyclovir daily forever? I, I would question why you're taking valcyclovir for the rest of your life daily. I mean, you, you know, that's a drug that is designed to treat herpetic disease. And so if you've been diagnosed with herpes, there are alternatives naturally that you might want to talk to your doctor about as well. One of the biggest, in my opinion, one of the best is using a combination of vitamin C and lysine. I've seen a number of people do really, really well with that combination, um, not need, I mean, to keep their herpetic outbreak under control, not necessarily need something like an acyclovir. You might check out um, Virid, V-I-R-I-D, is one of our nutritional supplemental formulas that contain both vitamin C and lysine. Natokinase, what are my thoughts on natokinase? It's a great enzyme. Um, if you're going to buy it, though, you need to buy it a natokinase derived from non-GMO or organic soy because, you know, natto is a soy-based enzyme. And if you're using a genetically modified pesticide-loaded soy to produce it, I, I would fear that you would get exposure to those things in your supplements as well. But as a, as a blood thinning agent, natokinase is, is very, very good at what it does. Um, Father had his thyroid removed. Anything he should uh, be mindful of? Why did they have to remove it? I mean, I, I would go back to the original. I mean, a lot of doctors will remove it because there was either like a cancer, what they suspected was a cancer, or nodules. And um, to me, just because they remove it doesn't mean that the reason the nodules or the cancer started went away, right? It's like it's like sweeping dirt under a rug. You know, the problem doesn't go away. The dirt's still there. You've just hidden it from view. Taking an organ out because uh, of a malfunction doesn't fix why the malfunction occurred. And that's what I would say your father needs to be the most concerned with is why that happened in the first place. And so getting with a doctor trained functionally, in my opinion, would be the best thing he could do. There's not like a supplement that he needs to do or something that he needs to take, especially if his entire gland has been removed. I mean, he's going to be on medicine the rest of his life. But, um, but that again, the more important question was why did they remove it in the first place? Why did it get to that point? What was it that created that scenario and changed that? Because it, it, it's just going to come back and affect a different organ or a different tissue. I like this question. Can we trust labels when they say products are manufactured on the same equipment as dairy, soy, or gluten, but are cleaned and tested gluten-free? Uh, you know, I, I think so. I think if the long as the end product is tested, um, I, I think you've got a level of awareness from that manufacturer. Um, they're going above and beyond what most other people would do. So as long as they're, when you, the question I would ask the manufacturer is, are they testing what level of gluten-free are they testing? Is it 20 parts per million? Is it five parts per million? I would feel much safer at five parts per million versus say a 20 parts per million test. So that would be the question I would ask. Um,
I had terrible food poisoning from bad pork. I've been tested for parasites. After four years, I'm still pork sensitive to where I get hives, horrible cramps, liquid bowels. Why? Because your body's allergic to pork, most likely. Um, you know, your body has created an antibody response against it because of that negative experience. And so you might also have some other things that are going on that you haven't resolved. And so your immune system hasn't had time to resolve its animosity against pork. That, that sometimes can be the case with many people. So for, for a lot of folks, you have to calm the immune system down enough to get to a point where you can reset it so that it's no longer reacting to things you might not be truly allergic to. How do we determine dosage for gluten shield? Um, you know, general quantity to take is two capsules before a meal, um, but dosage on any digestive enzyme is determined by success rate of digestion. So gluten shield is not just something that's designed to protect you from gluten cross-contamination or exposure, but it's also a full spectrum digestive enzyme. So if you have digestive distress and struggle, you know, some people do better on, on one, some people do better on three, some people do well on two. So it's, it's, it's kind of you're seeing where your body appreciates it the most. Supermarket where I used to get A2 milk from stopped selling it. I wonder how effective can a choice to buy Jersey whole milk uh, be to avoid A1. So Jer Jersey, just know, so you know, Jersey cows can be A2 or A1. Um, I know this because I own Jersey cows. I actually have jerseys that are that are A2, homozygous A2A2. So they 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 don't have any A1 casein at all. But you can get mixed Jersey where a Jersey might be A1A1, or a Jersey might be A2A1. In which case you're still going to get A1 casein exposure. So if you're going to buy Jersey milk from a local farmer, ask the farmer: Are they genetically testing their jerseys to to make sure they're A2A2? Um, and if they're doing that and they can show you evidence of that, then, you know, if you want to try dairy into your diet, um, that would be an option. Let's see. How do I read the QR code when only one phone? Um, snapshot it, Marcus. Um, or open, open, snapshot it and send yourself an image to your email and open it up on your desktop and then boom, you got the picture. I don't know if we have the link to it, but if we have a link, we can also throw that link up for you as well. You have to buy, somebody's asking again about folic acid. If it's folic acid, no good. Don't take it. Um, folic acid isn't good for you. It's synthetic folate. Folate, um, there are a number of studies and researchers believe that it contributes to cancer among other problems. So I'm not a big fan of folic acid. Let's see. Frustrating thing for me is that I can't build endurance. I walk 30 minutes each day and come back exhausted. I'm 71. Hashimoto. Suggest, I mean, that's a whole can of water. There's a lot of suggestions there, but ultimately if there's something that's holding you back or stopping you, from building up your endurance, you know, you know, one of the things, if you're exhausted after a 30 minute walk and, and I tell you to do Tabata or tell you to do high intensity interval, you're probably not gonna do that very well either. Um, if you're that tired and your diet's really dialed in, I, you know, but you're, ta if you're taking thyroid medicine for Hashimoto's, again, I would look to the cross-contamination of gluten. I would look to follow up with that doctor, make sure that your dosing structure is right. I would also, Look to testing your antibody levels to make sure that what you're doing in your diet and lifestyle are actually correcting those elevations and, and high antibodies to your thyroid. Because, I mean, there's a lot that could be potentially going on there that it's just too much to open in a short answer session. Uh, go back up just a or... Do you have a zinc that does not bother the stomach? I do. Um, we have two of them. Um, there's ultra zinc, um, which is a pill form, a tablet form. And then we have another one that's a zinc lozenge. It's called Zinc Soothe. And it, people do really well on the, as far as it on the stomach. It, it actually, uh, I haven't had anybody really ever complain about stomach upset with that. What medicines can I discuss with my doctor to substitute Synthroid? 
you can substitute Synthroid with Synthroid. You just have to get it compounded. Again, a compounding pharmacy is where they can make get you the same medicine without the filler ingredients that are grain derivative or, or um, gluten derivatives. How long can detox symptoms last? I'm four months into being gluten grain free. If you're four months in and you're better, but you're plateaued and you're falling no grain, no pain, Angela, you've probably got other things going on that need to be investigated. Um, you could have some nutritional deficiencies that are still playing a role. You could have other food sensitivities that you're not even aware of. You could have a heavy metal issue. Um, you could have a microbial imbalance in your GI tract that you could have a yeast overgrowth. You could be, you know, you could have some mold exposure. I mean, there's just a lot of different potential possibilities that it could be. But if you're following the protocol for four months and you find yourself at a point where you plateaued out, it's because you're missing something. If you read the last chapter of No Grain, No Pain, I talk about that very, very specifically, how a person can get through the protocol and do tremendously better, but then when they, when they hit those plateau points, it's really time to seek out individualized testing so that you can get better answers. Uh, how to increase weight on a gluten-free diet? Be, be patient. Um, and, and two, a lot of people, and just to, you know, because I don't know where you stand in terms of your mind on what is, is, is a healthy weight versus what is not a healthy weight. But the, I mean, number one, the best way to increase your weight, even on a gluten-free diet, is to make sure you're eating enough calories and potentially even eating more calories than what you might burn in a day if your attempt is to try to gain weight. But if you're trying to gain weight, the healthiest way to gain weight is to build lean mass. Lean mass would mean that you need to exercise physically to build the muscle mass of your body, and that will also help you gain the right kind of weight. How to do a liver flush um, without lemon. You, don't, you really don't. You're talking about, Eska, you're probably talking about a gallbladder flush, and so you don't, you, you know, if you're trying to try to do a gallbladder flush, you need some form of citrus. Um, and if you've got a stomach ulcer, it's not time to do a flush of your liver. It's time to ask why you have a stomach ulcer. Because a flush isn't going to fix your stomach ulcer. There's something that has caused that stomach ulcer, and that's what you need to figure out, right? What causes stomach ulcers? For some people, it's bacterial abnormalities, like Helicobacter pylori is a type of bacterial infection that can cause ulcer. Gluten sensitivity can cause ulcer. Dairy consumption, other foods um, that you might be allergic to or sensitive to can cause ulcerations in the stomach. Food additives, food preservatives can cause ulcerations in the stomach. I mean, there's just a lot of different things that can do that, and you need to figure that part out, and testing may be where you need to go next, like getting accurate tests to help you understand what could be tr contributing to that. Let's go down on both sides. Um, somebody's asking about where you can get No Grain, No Pain audiobook. Go to Audible, Amazon Audible. Um, they have an, an app you can download where you can listen to all kinds of books. And, and um, if you don't have an Audible account, when you open an Audible account for the first time, you get to pick a free book. And so if you, this is news to you and you had, don't have a copy of No Grain, No Pain, that's a way to get a free copy in the audio version. Um, now, what you don't get on the Audible audio version is you don't get all the bonuses and you don't get all that, you know, you'd have to, you, you don't get all the special stuff at the back where there's special links and other things, but you get the audio version. The other way you can order it on Kindle. Again, it's, you can get it uh, in, in most places in that audio format, but Audible allows you to get a copy for free if you don't already have an Audible account. Is it okay to take Detox C at the same time as iodine? Yes. Um, Is magnesium citrate and calcium citrate okay to take for oxalate problems? It is, but the bigger issue is why do you have oxalate problems? This is something that a lot of people don't realize is that oxalate problems oftentimes come from either an internal yeast overgrowth because different species of yeast are notorious for, in their, in their metabolic pathway, they can actually generate and create oxalates. Um, so if you're struggling with oxalate-based foods, but you find yourself, or you're struggling with high oxalate, but you're not eating oxalate, it could be that you have mold growing inside of you that's producing the oxalate. It could also be that you're living in a moldy environment where you're being exposed, and this is one of the reasons why, um, why you have high oxalate. So calcium and magnesium are really just kind of band-aids. You can take calcium and magnesium to bind oxalate but it, to prevent you from absorbing it, but it doesn't necessarily fix the problem if it's coming from yeast or mold. 
low blood creatinine. I mean, there are a number of reasons you could have low blood creatinine, um, but the, the biggest issue that you might have is that you're you're either you're not putting weight on or you're failing you're failing to heal and repair. So there's not enough creatinine actually being broken down. And so if you're talking about blood, we're not really measuring it to any high level because your body's almost like in a stasis where it's not healing, it's not repairing, but it's also not breaking down. Um, let's go down on the left. Can I take gluten shield with armor? Y you can take gluten shield um, but you should remember armor is designed to take on an empty stomach. And so you should, again, you want to take them a little bit apart because you don't want anything to interfere with your armor thyroid absorption. Any thought on microwaves? Yeah, don't use them. Um, and if you're going to use them at all, minimize it to the greatest degree that you can. Uh, microwaves aren't good for you. They're not good for the food that you're eating. Yeah, so Claire says, I'm trying to get genetic testing um, from gluten-free society for gluten. I'm, I'm in the UK. Is this possible? Yes, it is. Claire, if you'll reach out to glutenology at gmail.com, glutenology at gmail.com, and just send a note to either Laura or Jessica, they can get you a genetic test kit anywhere in the world, including the UK. So it's absolutely possible. Is there a... How would gluten sensitive testing via gluten free study be available? Okay, so I answered that. Is there a coupon active right now on gfs.com? We, you know, we do coupons, we do sales um, every week. So if you're if you if you don't get those, it's because you're not on on our emailing list. So make sure you get on our email list because that's how we send coupons out every week. And sometimes we do site wide sales where we go as high as twenty percent off. You know, sometimes you can get ten dollars off on an order. Um, but that's what I would suggest that you do. If you're on our email list, you will get access to those coupon codes every week when we send them out. Um, my GI doctor has me taking three milligrams of budesonide a day. It's very effective in keeping my GI tract calm. I have concerns about staying on this long term. The doctor says I need to continue to take uh, because I have been diagnosed with celiac and microscopic colitis when I have blood tests for the antibodies to see if I'm being exposed to gluten. The tests are always no gluten exposure, so I don't understand what the root cause is and why the doctor can't check for the root. That's a really good question. Um, the doctor's probably at the end of his, either at the end of his knowledge, right, or at the end of his desire to want to help you to, to dig so complex. A lot of doctors are so busy, they don't have time to spend much time with you, but you have to understand celiac and microscopic colitis, if you still have that and you're gluten-free and you're still struggling and your gut is still problematic, it's very possible your diet's fine except for you're eating foods that you might also be reactive to that are also contributing to that persistent colitis. And that's where you need additional testing because taking budesonide for the rest of your life is not a solution, it's a bandage. And you don't, you know, you don't want to band-aid this because a bandage doesn't fix the problem. And so if you're still eating things that are damaging your GI tract and eroding your mucosal lining and causing intestinal permeability and leaky gut, you're just going to subject yourself to more problems down the road. Um, somebody's asking if I believe in COVID vaccines. I don't, I don't know that I, I, I mean, the question is, it's not that whether or not you believe in it or you don't believe in it. I think the question is objective scientifically, Mary Ellen, which is, can we say they work? And the answer right now is if you've gotten one, we know they don't work because if you've gotten one, you can still get COVID. If you've gotten one, you can still spread COVID. If you've gotten one, you can still have bad COVID. Um, so everything that was promised, you know, you know, back in that original, I think it was January when they first came out, has failed, right? And, and then we're talking about empirically. You could say, oh, well, the studies say this and the studies say that. Who, who bought the studies? The companies that made the vaccines. And this is something... In, in medical science and research, you always have to have a great degree of bias when the people giving you the information and telling you to do the thing uh, have a history criminal record, right? If you look at Pfizer, I mean, they've paid out one of the largest multi-billion dollar fines for lying about their research and killing people. So, I mean, this is, it's not whether or not I believe in them or don't believe in them, it's, it's whether or not they actually work and what is a vaccine designed to do. A vaccine is designed to prevent you from getting a disease. This is not something that fits the definition of that. It doesn't do that. So, you know, I don't believe they work. I mean, the anecdotal, 
uh, from, from millions of people across the world that are still getting COVID is obvious. The empirical evidence is obvious. I mean, if you, if you look around, despite vaccines, now they're asking for a third and fourth and fifth shots. Why? Because the first two didn't work. So let's keep doing what didn't work. And maybe it'll work a third or a fourth or a fifth time. I think that's ludicrous. You know, what do we, how do we define insanity? It's, it's um, simply put, it's repetitive behavior with the expectation of a different outcome. And I think um, that's what we're seeing happen on a mass scale as an experiment in the human population. And I just, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of that experiment. I think people are being harmed. I think people are being wronged. I think they're not being given informed consent. And I think it's a travesty. And I think many of the doctors that are, that are saying how safe this is should be held accountable at the end of the day. Whether or not that'll happen is another matter, but um, those are my opinions. But I, I don't know that I believe, uh, believe in it, if, if, if that answers your question. Are, is organic kombucha okay? I, I don't like kombucha. I, kombucha is basically sugar and alcohol water um, you know, under the guise of a healthy drink. So I, I'm not a big fan of it. If you, want, if you want to get your probiotic from food, do a good fermented vegetable. Um, what's a good test for food sensitivity, food allergies? There's lots, of, um, there's lots of ways to measure, depending on what you're actually trying to measure, Deborah. I've been saying now for a number of months, we're actually working on direct-to-consumer testing that measures IgG, IgA, IgM, immune complex, and T-cell responses, which is what should be measured if you're trying to get a good feel for what, how you're reacting to food. Most tests that are out there commercially now, like some of the popular online brands, they, they don't measure anything other than IgG, which is highly, uh, it's highly inaccurate and, it, and you have a tendency for that test to give you a lot of false positives. So it's not a test I recommend. Um, so stay patient with me. If you're on my email list, you'll get, we'll, we'll send that update out as soon as it becomes available. We're, we're this close. Uh, let's see. Keep going down. I don't know if we have anything more there. So yeah, another person in the UK is asking about nutritional deficiency testing available in the UK. It, it, you know, we do we do nutritional deficiency testing for people in the UK. I, might, I mean, we work with people from the UK on a regular basis. So, I mean, but but not commercially at this point. If you wanted to do that, you'd really I, ideally want to call my office and, and schedule time. Uh, let's see. I think, well, what time is 7.15? We got more questions than I can still get to. So I, th I think what I'm going to do is go home and eat dinner like I do every Monday night. Um, look, I, I thank you for spending your evening with me. I'm um, really hoping you guys are getting behind the No Grain, No Pain Challenge. Again, the contest ends at the end of February. We're going to be giving away a lot of great prizes for the winners. Um, you can reach out to my team, Glutenology at Gmail. If you are hearing this for the first time and you want to get the details of the contest, I encourage you to do that and, and join us. It's not too late to join us. This whole month of January, you can jump in at any time uh, to join into the contest. So anyway, wishing you excellent health and a fantastic week. We'll see you back next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m., Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.